Good morning and welcome to Compass Christian Church Online. Please join me in singing our opening song. Our reading today comes from the letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Listen for God's word. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known by everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. Here ends our reading. May God bless our hearing, understanding, and living of these words. A few years back in Atlantic City, a woman won a bucket full of quarters at a slot machine. She had dinner plans with her husband, but she first wanted to stash her quarters in the room upstairs. She met him at the restaurant and said, I'll be back down and we'll eat. She went to the elevator and noticed two men already aboard, both of whom were African American. One was big, very big. She froze. Her first thought was, they're going to rob me. And her next, don't be a bigot. They're probably both perfectly nice gentlemen. These two thoughts were at war within her. And she stood there frozen, feeling flustered and ashamed. With a mighty effort of will, she stepped onto the elevator without making eye contact and turned to face the doors as they shut. Tense seconds passed as the elevator didn't move. She felt trapped, and perspiration born of fear poured out of every pore. Then one of the men said, Hit the floor. Instinct told her, do what they tell you. The bucket of quarters flew upwards, and she threw out her hands and collapsed on the elevator carpet. A shower of coins rained down on her. She silently prayed, take my money and spare me. More seconds passed. She heard one of the men say politely, ma'am, If you'll just tell us what floor you're going to, we'll push the button. She lifted her head and looked up at the men. They reached down to help her. Confused, she struggled to her feet. When I told my man here to hit the floor, said the average-sized one, I meant that he should hit the elevator button for our floor. I didn't mean for you to hit the floor, ma'am. He spoke kindly, 
and it was obvious he was trying hard not to laugh. She thought, my God, what a fool I've made of myself. She wanted to blurt out an apology, but how do you apologize to two perfectly respectable gentlemen for thinking they were going to rob you? The three of them gathered up her quarters and refilled the bucket. When the elevator arrived at her floor, they insisted on walking her to her door. At her door, they bid her a good evening. As she slipped into her room, she could hear them in the hallway roaring with laughter as they walked back to the elevator. The woman brushed herself off. She pulled herself together and went downstairs for dinner with her husband. The next morning, flowers were delivered to her room, a dozen roses. Attached to each rose was a crisp $100 bill. The card said, thanks for the best laugh we've had in years. It was signed, Eddie Murphy and Michael Jordan. Anxiety can make us do foolish things. Today, we're going to look at how to cope with anxiety. We live in anxious times, do we not? We're apprehensive about the world, fretful about the future, uneasy about life in general. The coronavirus has taken a wrecking ball to the medical, social, educational, business, electoral, and financial institutions around us. And we don't know for how long or how far that wrecking ball will continue swinging. Maybe we're recently unemployed due to closures, or if not, worried sick that our sector will be next. We're worried about our health and the health of other family members, old and young. We're anxious for our kids with an extended spring break that may close out the school year. We're wondering if it makes any sense at all to think about, much less plan, a summer vacation. And the fall? That's too far away even to consider. The list goes on and on of the things that keep us up at night. Although there's a lot of talk about anxiety these days, what exactly is it? One definition of anxiety is a psychic response of dread to a vague, unspecified threat. Anxiety is different from fear. Fear is about a specific danger, while anxiety isn't specific, but rather diffuse, vague, without an object, an invisible enemy. In anxiety, our very existence seems threatened. At its core, it's the threat of fundamental loss or separation. It is experienced by all human beings. It has both positive and negative aspects because it can spur us to grow or it can hinder our development. There are both normal and abnormal types of anxiety. Normal anxiety, also called existential anxiety, is natural, expected, and a potentially constructive part of life. Such normal anxiety is a part of freedom and responsibility. It spurs us to grow and mature in the choices we make and helps us creatively cope with life's challenges. It is normal to feel anxious about the powers of nature or sickness and death. <clears throat> Abnormal anxiety, on the other hand, is disproportionate to the objective danger. It involves repression or concealing the truth about oneself and manifests itself by isolation and physical reactions produced by the mental stress. There are different ways of coping with it as well. This is the big picture on anxiety, 
But let's look at some specifics. We've said that all human beings experience anxiety. But why is that? The best and brightest minds in psychology from the 19th and 20th centuries each formulated an answer to the question of why anxiety is universal. Answers range from separation from mom, fear of dad's punishment, the process of becoming an individual, or inferiority feelings. Others said it's the result of trying to change life patterns, disapproval in personal relations, or a threat to our life values. Psychologists seek answers to this question from the individual, while sociologists seek answers to this question from the larger social context. Sociologists would say that anxiety is a result of role conflicts from cultural change and social mobility. An example might be the roles of men and women and how they've changed over the past hundred years or the increasing urbanization of the world and its impact on traditional societies. Whether the answers are psychological or sociological, underneath it all, anxiety comes from the loss or separation from that which is seen as necessary for existence. And this is where the best and brightest Christian theologians of the 20th century stepped in because they saw God as necessary for our existence. Paul Tillich believed that anxiety is from the threat of non-being, which includes not only death, but guilt and meaninglessness too. Reinhold Niebuhr saw anxiety as the human condition, brought about from the paradox of our freedom and finiteness. We have the freedom to transcend ourselves in order to anticipate dangers, but when we do so, we understand ourselves all the more as finite, as limited creatures. Psychologists, sociologists, and theologians have all attempted to answer the questions about anxiety for our jittery times. We live in an apprehensive era, one uneasy about life in general. Paul was dealing with an anxious group of folks in Philippi. As he said in a letter to another of his churches, I am under daily pressure because of the anxiety for all the churches. Daily pressures? Paul knew about them. Anxieties? He had his share. He's writing to the first church he established on European soil in Macedonia. It's in Philippi that he and Silas meet Lydia, who sells purple cloth, and where he and Silas are attacked, stripped, and beaten by a mob after Paul exercises a girl with a spirit of divination. Paul sums up this chapter in his life by saying, Although we had suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, we had courage in our God to declare the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. The anxiety Paul experienced while there is now being experienced by his church, with whom he's feeling anxious as he writes to them from jail. The main theme of his letter is persistence in the face of opposition and how not to be anxious in the midst of trying circumstances. Paul knows something about anxiety and speaks about this to his spiritual children who are facing the same. Here he is in prison, an anxiety-producing situation, and yet he writes to the Philippians of the peace of God and the God of peace. To an anxious church, Paul speaks of peace. Anxious people want to know how to find the peace of God and the God of peace. In a troubled and anxious world, how do we create a zone of peace in our personal, communal, and global lives? 
How do we create a hedge against the anxieties that threaten to overwhelm us? The reading we heard outlined four coping mechanisms for confronting anxiety that are as true now as they were then. The first way to help cope with anxiety is to rejoice. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. The first buffer against anxieties is rejoicing. Notice what Paul does not say. He doesn't say, rejoice in your changing circumstances. Nor does he say, rejoice in whatever comes your way. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Why? Because although our circumstances will change, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We can always rejoice because God is God, and God is good all the time, now, and forever. We can rejoice because no matter what comes our way, the Lord will make a way. We can rejoice in the Lord on the mountaintops of our lives and on the dung heaps too. Whether we're secure on the heights or down in the dumps, God loves us and we need not be anxious. As 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on God because he cares for you. The first part of our zone of peace that can help us cope with life's anxieties is to rejoice in the Lord always. The second buffer in creating a zone of peace is gentleness. Paul says, let your gentleness be known to everyone. Such gentleness was a hallmark of early Christians who believed Christ when he said, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. The gentleness Paul speaks of is one that trusts in God's power and love revealed in a helpless man nailed to a cross. This gentleness is stronger than any human strength, whether military, economic, or cultural. It is a gentleness that doesn't return evil for evil, but overcomes evil with good. It's a gentleness that realizes we can't have a zone of peace within our life if we're creating chaos outside our life. It's a gentleness that realizes we can't have peace in the United States when we're creating wars overseas or when politicians use fear to divide us on the home front. All things are interconnected. If we're to have peace within our lives, then our gentleness must be known to everyone outside our lives. The second buffer in coping with life's anxieties is to trust that God's way of gentleness and love is the only way to live. The third buffer in coping with life's anxieties is prayer. Paul says, do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul begins this peace zone by focusing on God, then moving to our gentle living. Now he brings the focus back to God and says we should pray. In prayer, we move the focus from our problems to God's power. Paul lists out different parts of prayer. Among them are supplications and requests. Now, for many of us, that pretty much sums up the extent of what our prayers consist of. What I want and what I need. Supplications 
and request. Request and supplications. So often our prayers, instead of getting us out of ourselves and focused on God, simply make us and our problems the central focus. God somehow disappears. Paul lists another word, another part of prayer that's essential, thanksgiving. If rejoicing in the Lord focuses on who God is, then thanksgiving focuses on the blessings God has given us. Thanksgiving reminds us of all the good we've enjoyed in the past. It reframes our present anxieties in the light of past blessings and future promises. Instead of getting stuck on ourselves with requests and supplications, we're freed by thanksgiving to focus on God's overabundant blessings in our lives. The third buffer in a zone of peace is giving thanks to God in prayer. The final component in building a zone of peace in the midst of anxiety is to think and do. This comes from the last two verses where Paul says, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, pleasing, commendable, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things you've learned and received and heard and seen in me. Just as Paul moved from God to us in the first part of the peace zone, he now does the same again. He moves from rejoicing to gentleness and now from prayer to thinking and doing. Paul lists out a series of virtues, of character traits that the Philippians are to give serious consideration to as they deal with anxieties. If their minds are focused on these worthy and noble ideals, they'll be transformed and renewed and conformed to the mind of Christ. These admirable virtues are to be pondered on But pondering is only so much of that. They're not just abstract values. They are to be enacted in the lives of the Philippians as they are in Paul's own life. He holds himself up as a living example of these virtues and says, keep on doing the things you've learned and received and heard and seen in me. Pondering is only part of it. Producing it is the other. Paul knows that faith is as often caught by example as taught by instruction. He's holding up his walk as evidence of his talk. They mutually reinforce each other. Paul is saying, do as I say and do as I do. The fourth component of building a zone of peace is to think upon noble virtues and embody them. Paul's advice for those seeking a zone of peace, a buffer in coping with a world of anxiety, is this. Rejoice in the Lord and let our gentleness be known to others. Pray in everything with thanksgiving. Ponder the mind of Christ and embody the actions of Christ so that we may know the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding. These four things will help us cope with whatever anxieties come our way in life. If anxiety at its root is the fundamental threat of loss or separation, from that which is necessary for existence. Paul wrote these words to another church in Rome to share with us. You'll find them in Romans chapter 8, verses 35, 37 to 39. If the anxieties of this week 
and the weeks ahead of us have you ready to hit the floor. Instead, I'd encourage us to stash these words in the recesses of our heart, post them to our mirror, our refrigerator, or car visor. Let these words be a shield and prayer so that the peace of God might guard our heart and mind. What will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or nakedness or famine or peril or sword? No, for in all these things, We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And let God's people say, Amen. As we prepare to come to this table, we are reminded that God's bonds cross all distances, not just social distances, but physical distances and time distances. We are connected. And so as we prepare ourselves to share communion in a different way, I would invite you in your homes to grab some bread, grape juice, whatever you would like to have as elements of your time to share, whether alone with family, we encourage you not only to feed on the word, but also to feed on God's grace around your table. We will now hear a song. Jesus was gathered with his friends. He took bread. When he'd given thanks to God, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. Again, he gave God thanks and praise and he gave it to them saying, drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all, so that sin may be forgiven. As often as you drink this, do so remembering me. I'd invite you, as we close out our time together, to join with me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God bless you all. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. Amen.